Okay, you can come along too. But you're paying for your own ticket. Hey, for once I got to see a movie on opening day. In fact, I got the first showing at my local theater. Far From Home is about Spider-Man, Peter Parker, trying to just have a relaxing European uh, school trip with his buddy Ned and MJ, whom he says he has developed feelings for, and Nick Fury needs him to help save the world again. Because a guy named Mysterio popped in from an alternate Earth and says that these creatures called Elementals have destroyed his home Earth, and now he needs to stop them here. You know Mysterio from the comics. You know him from some of the cartoons. You can probably guess what's going on with him. There were several things that did not surprise me. I kind of saw them coming. In Venice, you, you hear the music playing as, you know, it seems like the you know something's going up with the water, then the music stops, and I totally saw that big upright, like the big explosion of water as this aquatic entity came into being. And it was still, it was still done very well. I just, it's one of those things where, yeah, you see it coming, but that's not a detriment. And that's kind of true with other things here, um, which I'll get into later. The uh, cast is very well done. Tom Holland has great chemistry with pretty much everyone. <laughs> I wanted to say he had great chemistry with Zendaya, and he does, but he, he has great chemistry with John Favreau, and I was blanking on Jake Gyllenhaal. Michelle, MJ, she gets a bit more focus, and that's because, well, Peter has feelings for her. He's developed these feelings in the year since the end of Endgame, and uh, so that kind of makes sense. It, it is a little surprising, since we didn't really see much of their relationship since the end of Homecoming. But it's just, Endgame was like last month, and for some people, again, this week. So it's just kind of weird how, how that movie left off, and then bam, one year later, um, with uh, Far From Home. And, you know, there, there's no real fallout from Aunt May figuring out that he's Spider-Man. And I kind of would have liked to have seen that, if only for the comedic potential like, she seriously freaked out that her nephew is a superhero and that he kept this from her, but they still seem as about as buddy-buddy and loving as they were in in uh, Homecoming. Which, you know, on the one hand, that's nice that, you know, they still love each other, but at the same time, like, you can't say that this revelation didn't have any ramifications. It's There had to have been something, and I would have liked to have seen that. I kind of thought, in the back of my head, I was thinking, are they going to, like, at all bring up Uncle Ben? And I, they don't need to, like, play out the whole death scenario again. I'm just saying, like, are they going to bring him up at all? Is he, uh, you know, just mention power and responsibility, anything like that? But but they don't, which maybe they're just going to avoid altogether. Because there, there, is, there is something at the end, like, um, uh, like, after well, there there are a couple of post credit scenes, and uh, one of them is definitely teasers for like a third movie with Tom Holland, uh, or at least with this you know version of Spider Man, and they they could avoid it altogether, which would be fine because we got it's it's like Bruce Wayne's parents being shot in the alley. It's like we've seen it so many times. Do we need to see it again? Um, there, there's the character of, I forget, I forget the character's name, but he, he's one of the teachers that oversees the trip, and he was part of the, uh, academic decathlon. He was the teacher in charge of that in Homecoming, and one thing I noticed about him is that he didn't really, you know, he wanted to take a selfie, but he used an old, an older fa uh, design camera, not a, not a camera phone, a camera you know, kind of like the classic-looking camera you might see Spider-Man using in, like, the 90s TV show, probably an older model. Um, he used paper maps, so he seems to be a guy that is more comfortable with 
older style uh, accoutrement than even a smartphone, which it's it doesn't like play a big deal in the movie. It's just one of those character quirks that's kind of subtle and in some cases is mostly played for laughs. So I'm just going to get right into the spoilers, but before I do, I'm going to say it is worth watching. It's If you liked Homecoming, you're going to like this one. As far as all the Marvel movies go, at the moment, and this can change, um, I would say that it's kind of in the middle of the Marvel movies, but at the higher end of that middling spectrum. Uh, I wouldn't call it one of their best, but it's not even close to their worst. So, yeah, I, if you haven't seen it yet, I would recommend watching the rest of this later and going, uh, and, and and going to see the movie. If especially if you're a Spider-Man fan and a Marvel movie fan. One of the opening scenes is a memorial for the fallen Avengers in Endgame, including Captain America. So I'm wondering, did the Avengers tell the public that Captain America traveled back in time to? have himself a private life, or that he died fighting evil steroidal grimace. Spider-Man gets recruited by Nick Fury. He gets these uh, glasses from Tony Stark. And, you know, Peter's apprehensive about going on this mission because he just didn't want to save the world on his, on his class trip. He wanted to relax, but Fury's on his back about it, and Mysterio uh, is like, you know, give Give the kid a break. Give the kid a break. And he's encouraging him to, like, have fun, live life, be a teenager, and so forth. Um, the glasses are, you know, they're from Tony Stark. So they're really a uh, highly advanced AI that lets him control a wealth of Stark technologies. It does end up in some shenanigans that forces him to use his powers in the presence of his classmates, but on the sly. He uh, he doesn't seem to really trust himself, and trust is a recurring theme in this movie. It's not just a matter of, oh, can, can you trust Nick Fury? Because he's Nick Fury, you know? It's also like trusting, you know, trusting Mysterio. And uh, really it's about Peter trusting himself. Because, he, you know, reporters think he's going to be the next Iron Man, which kind of makes sense because when they asked him, he was wearing the Iron Spider suit. Which I guess he keeps in his room this weird containment thing. Stark chose you. You're an Avenger, so you, uh, you're gonna, we're expecting you to be the next Iron Man. And he's not sure about that. I think that kind of plays out with his spider sense. They don't call it a spider sense, they call it Peter Tingles, which I'm kind of horrified if that catches on with the audiences. But he, uh, it, they kind of work, the spider sense kind of works, and it kind of doesn't. It's kind of on and off. We don't, we don't get, like, a visual cue to them like we're used to, like the squiggles in the comics or stuff slowing down in some of the movies or what have you. Uh, it's like he doesn't trust himself with the kind of responsibility that comes with being the next Tony Stark or being his spiritual successor. So... That may mean that, that that could have affected his spider sense, I think. In that he doesn't trust himself to know what the right decision is all the time. He doesn't, and because you know, his spider sense warns him of danger. His judgment is clouded because of his lack of faith in himself. And there could be more to it that I'm that it just isn't occurring to me now. But I I, I wouldn't be I mean I wouldn't be surprised if one of the screenwriters said, yeah, we want we want to like show that his, you know, insecurities were blocking his spider sense or something along those lines. So we can all expect that Mysterio is not exactly a good guy and that the whole alternate Earth thing was bunkum. I didn't really expect him to have a whole team, but, you know, he's he has, uh, after he gets the glasses, Edith, from uh, Peter Parker who, you know, is trusting him to be the new Iron Man. Uh, you know, Quentin Beck goes on this, you know, he, he's, he casts, he uses technology, like, which isn't, 
I mean, that's what he did with, you know, in his classic version. This is just a lot flashier. But he has a whole team of former Stark employees that you know, have been wronged in some way. The guy that Obadiah Stane yelled at because they couldn't shrink down the arc reactor like Tony did. He's on the team. Other people that I don't think appeared in previous Marvel movies, but, you know, they they felt wronged by Stark in some fashion. So they create this persona of a alternate Earth hero that so they can fool everyone and get access to Stark's technology. It's clever. It's very clever. And at first, like, the illusions he casts are, well, him flying around and fighting these giant elemental monsters. The, uh... But then he, you know, Spider-Man finds out what he's done and confronts him, and it's like... Then the illusions just go ramped up to, like, 11. It's not really trippy like, say, Doctor Strange, but in its own way, it just really messes with your head and your perceptions and perspective, and it's done very, very well. And that's not the only thing I kind of expected. I did think they uh, revealed that earlier than I had anticipated, but, well, if you're familiar with the comics, or even if you just watch the animated series, you had to believe that they weren't going to go with this hero thing for him. But one thing I kind of expected was the whole uh, Ned romance with Betty Brant. And at first it plays out like, you know, like he's sitting next to her on the plane, and he's like asking her if she's into this, into that, and she says, nope, nope. Uh, then they hit, hit a little turbulence, and I guess that's what sparks them into this uh, relationship. And Ned calls off his whole American Bachelors in Europe plan with Peter that he was trying to convince him of the whole time. And they're just so lovey-dovey, and they admittedly make a cute couple, if for largely comedic reasons. But then when they get back to American soil... I knew they were going to break up. I thought it was... No, I thought what was going to happen was that they were going to have this fight about this small, insignificant thing. But no, they're just... They land, and Peter said, and Peter's like, hey, we should go on a double date. Like, no, we broke up. We, we broke up. And they did so amicably, which is actually kind of nice. <laughs> it's one of the smaller elements of the movie that just help build this atmosphere that feels very much like a Spider-Man environment, much like with Peter having to choose between Peter Parker and Spider-Man, having fun and being responsible and helping out when and where he can. MJ finds out who he is, or rather, she, she says she suspected she, he was Spider-Man, but she plays it off like she knew the whole time. And she, she her personality hasn't really changed much. She's you know, she speaks the truth to everyone sort of attitude. It is such a departure from the MJ we know. Like you could say, you could argue that in some ways that this acerbic, snarky teenage girl is kind of like uh, a modern-day version of the kind of, you know, personality MJ was when she was first introduced. I mean, you might have to take a couple of leaps, but I, I think the argument is there. But aside from that, it's such a drastic departure from the character, you know, comic readers are familiar with. You kind of wonder why they didn't just call her Michelle and just leave it at that, not try and give her the classic name so uh, it didn't seem like they were just trying to say, hey, look, isn't that an Easter egg? That, that's a reference you should understand. So, yeah, that's... Eh? And don't get me wrong, I like the character of Michelle, I, I like her just fine, but she doesn't have to be MJ to be likable. And, like, maybe this is just the classicist in me, but I don't think there would have been a problem with keeping, you know, a character named MJ, like, in the comics. Just make her a redhead. Big freaking whoop. But, you know, and at the same time, you could work up an original character. And if... if I don't know. But, like I said, she she uh, she gets more focus here, and uh, there's, there's this life-threatening situation with her, Ned, Betty, Flash, and Happy, 
and she's, you know, she, she reveals that her whole deal of, you know, just blurting out the truth without, with complete abandon is kind of an, uh, a sign of her own insecurities. A weird thing about that scene, Happy says he's in love with Spider-Man's aunt, and there were two people in there who don't know who Spider-Man is, so that's, that's kind, of, kind of risking it there, aren't you happy? But hey, they thought they were going to die. So soon after Endgame, with very little focus on Peter and Michelle uh, interacting with each other, it just feels like, oh, well, Peter has feelings for Michelle now, and it's like, okay, it's kind of sudden, but... Gotta, the movie's got to move along. It's not that other stuff doesn't happen. It's just, uh, it's like, I mean, it's just stuff like I think I really think you should just experience for yourself. A lot of it is Peter, you know, doing doing what he always does. He struggles with. Uh, a lot of the movie is him struggling with: should I do this? Should I do that? Should I take on this responsibility? Should I not? And he just doesn't feel like he's up to the task, and. It's it's kind of part and parcel for us for a Spider-Man story, uh, and it's still very well done. Uh, eventually, he I mean he goes through a couple of different suits here. We see him in the Iron Spider, the Homecoming suit. Uh, they basically make him a noir suit. He does make himself a new suit, and it's a lot like his, the classic suit, but they exchange blue for black, or exceedingly dark blue that may as well be black. And personally, I it's not a direction I would have gone, but part of that is because uh, you know I think you know Spider-Man's one of those heroes that should be you know bright to evoke a kind of optimism and trust. Uh, but it's and also it's like the whole black and red color scheme thing has kind of gotten me annoyed thanks to certain. Decisions. <sighs> so Spider-Man's spidey sense actually starts working in his favor in his confrontation with Mysterio. And I'm not going to get into details because you really got to watch it. It's, it's done very well. And uh, so everyone makes it back to America safe and sound for the most part. Uh, there, there's this moment with Flash Thompson... I guess like his butler or his driver picks him up, and he said, and he says like, "Mother couldn't join us." And, mm -mm, like mm. earlier in the film, Edith is showing Peter some of the task texts from his fellow students, and I like it matches the picture with what they're texting, and uh, <laughs> Ned and Betty they're sitting right next to each other and they're texting, "I miss you, I miss you too." <laughs> Just like that really obnoxious couple. <clears throat> but anyway, I saw this uh, this text message being sent from one of the students that said, uh, Mother and Father, I haven't heard from you in a while. And I thought that was... MJ. I thought I saw MJ's picture. I didn't get a good look at the picture next to it. So I thought maybe she was just being snarky or maybe like at her home life she's much more polite and reserved. But no, I guess... Uh, I guess Flash has, you know, has some absent parents. Maybe that explains why he's just a jerk. The end credits, there are a couple of end credits scenes. The one is re the reveal that the Nick Fury and Maria Hill we've been watching this whole movie haven't been Maria Hill and Nick Fury. They actually call the real Nick Fury, but he's... You know, he's listening to what they say before he hangs up. And before, you know, at first it looks like he's on a on a beach like that uh, one beer commercial. Uh, I, I, I forget the name of the beer, but um, it's like, but no, he, no, he, he's somewhere else. And it raises a lot of questions. Second end credit scene, Peter's talking to May and Happy before going on his date with Michelle. Uh, and by date, I, you figure, like, oh, he's going to swing over there, he's going to change, and he's going to gonna go to dinner or see a movie or something like that. No, he lands in front of her as Spider-Man, swings her across the city. They, before he takes off, a I guess they he drops her off in Times Square or something, because there's this big TV screen on a building that's talking about the 
fight with Mysterio. And the Daily Bugle broke uh, the news of some footage that makes it appear as if Spider-Man murdered Mysterio so that only he would become the next Iron Man and control his technology and so forth. It's reported by J. Jonah Jameson, played by J.K. Simmons. A lot of people are going to be freaking out about that. Though he, he, he's bald. I'm, I'm, I'm not used to a bald JJ. Is he, uh, is, it's not like he's completely shaven like Professor X or something. He's got that ring around his head. But, I mean, may, maybe J.K. Simmons didn't want to wear a, a wig. So Jonah reveals a pretty big secret in that footage. And uh, I, I'm not going to... I mean, you could probably guess what it is, but I'm not going to say what it is. Even though this is, you know, like, spoilers, but still... It's definitely worth watching through the credits, and there's just, overall, it was a really fun experience. I, I would definitely recommend seeing it. The fallout of what they reveal at the end, that leads to another uh, F-bomb cut halfway through. The um, There are ways around it. This movie shows that they could easily find a way around it and resolve it, but... It's a little too easy that way. So I'm wondering if they have something else in mind. Anyway. So, yeah. Go see the movie if you're a Spidey fan. Go see the movie if you liked Homecoming. Go see the movie if you like Marvel movies. I'll see you next time. Later.